Hi, if there's anybody out there, I'm just checking to hear that, that to find out if you can hear me. Hello, yes, this is Genevieve from Learning Times. I can hear you. If you'd Wonderful. like to test your uh, video, you're welcome to do that as well. I'm welcome to do what? I'm sorry. That's right. You're welcome to turn on your video and make sure that's working as well if you're planning yeah, to I'm use it. I'm looking at um, my slideshow on my screen. Yes, I see that. It looks great. Seems like you're ready to go as long as you're not planning to turn on your camera. No, I'm not. Wonderful. So at what time should I start? You can begin now. Um, I've begun recording the session and uh, transcript is on. So we're set up on the end, this end in terms of tech and people are able to enter the room when they like. Great. I'm going to start in about one minute. Great. Thank you. Hello to everybody out there in internet land and um, participating in this wonderful conference. Um, I'm Roger Kessler and I'm in the Department of Family Medicine at uh, University of Colorado, uh, also part of the um, National Research of a Network of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And we're gonna talk today about uh, patient reported measures, which is a wonderful um, uh, Wynn's presentation was a wonderful way to transition to this work. Um, as we continue to focus on being pragmatic, um, the issues of um, patient uh, reporting and patient perception of a range of different things is particularly critical, but our workflows in the general case are not set up to do that. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, just a bit of background about me. Um, I am a, um, a dissemination and implementation scientist focused on pragmatic on the ground work in underserved um, uh, population and practices. Um, for me, I look to California Larry Green when he observed one time that he's um, committed to eliminating the distinction between research and quality improvement. Uh, so for me, any research that I'm engaged in has to have relevance and meaning to the organization that uh, we're part of um, as a research clinical team. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, just not particularly interested in, interesting to me. Um, all right, so there we go. No conflicts of interest. Um, going to just review why is this of importance, look at whether in fact patient reported measures are acceptable both to patients and to uh, uh, settings and individuals within settings. I'm going to move to discussing quality of life as an exemplar of that type of measure. Um, I will mention that I've been involved with uh, John Ware, uh, the developer of the um, SF3624128, who has now generated a very brief generic and disease-specific quality of life measures, the QGen and QDIS that we'll discuss in a bit. Um, I'll then go on to talk about two examples of projects that I've been involved in. Uh, the first uh, in uh, Arizona during my tenure at Arizona State University, and uh, the second, a project in a family medicine practice uh, in the Valley in uh, Colorado. And uh, I would then love to hear your thoughts and ideas about uh, the stuff I'm presenting, um, really part of my motivation in doing this is to get help and assistance in thinking through the multiple issues involved in this. So um, I was uh, lucky enough to be funded uh, 
to do a uh, COVID related project focused on using electronic health records and uh, quality of life measurement as a practice level tool to generate risk stratification, triage and clinical pathways. And that really was the uh, spur generating the ideas that I, I'm talking about today. It's a work in progress. Um, we have uh, three research teams in um, and practices in Arizona and one in Colorado. And um, it was, it's a mix of uh, quality improvement about identifying most challenged patients, as well as looking at the state of uh, electronic health record sharing capacity um, that will generate one of the indices that we'll talk about in a bit. So uh, there is a lot of conversation that focuses on patient reported measurement as an important tool, as an evaluator of services, as well as um, um, patient reports about their functioning, their health behavior, their preferences, uh, and the interest in theory is further developed than the on the ground systematic use of such measures. There is a range of uh, literature suggesting that um, uh, use of patient reported measures is acceptable to patients as well as to providers, um, but there is not a whole lot of evaluation at this point of the um, implementation issues and the effectiveness issues. So lots of information is collected. A uh, much smaller percentage of that information is uh, useful in uh, care delivery. Um, there has been observation of the utility in uh, supporting decision-making, risk stratification, goal setting, uh, and um, communication, communication between provider and patient and communication um, with the team. Um, the issue of within practice communication becomes more relevant as we focus on team-based care. And it's important to be able to uh, observe relationships between uh, such communication and clinical actions. Um, we know that long measures are challenging and um, part of the excitement of my work with Dr. Ware has been that um, the generic quality of life measure uh, takes on average a minute to complete. Uh, and if you add the disease specific measure, the median time is between two and three minutes. And what seems fairly consistent across reports is um, they're going to be used and used well if, in fact, the information is valued, prioritized, and used in um, care decision making. So as many of you who are involved in uh, collecting data at a practice level, um, it's challenging. In a bit, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the response rates that we've gotten in the methodologies that we've used to try to collect the data. So um, patient engagement is challenging. Uh, response rates for requests of this information are very mixed. Um, clinicians see value, but they're also, again, challenged uh, by the uh, processes and procedures necessary to do it. Um, in the general case, such measurement is not yet integrated into health records. Um, I'm involved in multiple projects moving in that direction. 
but not uh, as yet demonstrating uh, the ability to generally do that. Um, so again, the underscore is, yep, we can collect the data, but translating that data into the care delivered is a significant effort. And uh, practices need support to sustain this kind of activity. Um, I'm in the middle of preparing a budget for a project that will take tens of hours from the project practice. And because of budgetary constraints, I believe um, we're gonna give practices $2,000 as a stipend for a year. And um, in my experience, such a model of um, uh, minimal reimbursement for asking overstressed practices to do that is, is challenging. So behind the excitement of moving in this direction is an entire set of challenges and issues that continue to need to be grappled with. So what to measure? Um, are we talking about generic measures of something? Are we talking about disease specific measures or some, some combination? Um, I'm a health psychologist by training and have been tracking the development of measures such as the PHQ for many, many, many years. And I think a careful reading of the literature suggests um, that a focus, at least in the mental health world, on uh, narrow disease specific measurement is inadequate, um, doesn't generate a whole lot of new case finding and limits the uh, uh, focus on overall function. Um, I think that in the measurement, in the patient measurement world, the entire issue of adaptive function uh, is becoming louder and louder an issue for us to focus on. And per, when patients are queried about what's most important to them about the outcomes of care, uh, there's very often a focus on quality of life. As I just mentioned, uh, it's been identified as most important outcome to patients. Um, quality of life measures of a variety of sorts are uh, strong predictors of clinical, economic, and social consequences of health and disease. And if you look at um, contemporary quality of life measurement, um, they can be done quite rapidly with only a small question bank. Just give me a few seconds. I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm on time track. So um, because of my concern with the limitations of mental health measurement and my pretty much sole focus on behavioral care as part of primary care settings, I became more and more concerned with using um, measurement of uh, psychiatric dysfunction, disease specific psychiatric dysfunction. And um, as I moved towards looking at other brief measures, um, I became less inclined to focus on things like the PHQ or the GID or things like that, both because of measurement limitations, focus limitations, and because they reinforced behavioral care as uh, external to primary care and uh, quasi-psychiatric intervention, which has not been the goal of much of the direction of contemporary behaviorally focused primary care. Uh, if you look at the quality of life literature, there is a very diverse literature focusing on effectiveness in um, predicting treatment response, 
uh, overall future health, uh, cost of healthcare, productivity, return to work, and morbidity and mortality. Uh, so um, the interesting thing about this is if you look at this list and think about the stakeholders who are involved in data, um, quality of life measurement is important to patients. It's important to care planning and delivery. It's important to administrators and it's equally important to um, policymakers. And um, so now here is the um, 10 item Q gem that uh, can be completed very, very rapidly on a five point uh, uh, Likert scale. Just take a minute to go through these questions. Uh, it's been validated um, in multiple, multiple settings, uh, different subpopulations. Um, and this is the follow-up disease specific scale, focusing on limiting how much did a disease state limit function. So the combinations generate a generic physical health and mental health score, as you're aware from other work of Dr. Ware's work and also a focus on specific disease states um, that are of particular importance. As you guys are all aware, if you look at uh, a population of folks 60 and above, um, the number of comorbidities is very large. And as one gets older, the population tends to have five or more chronic disease comorbidities. So identifying an aspect of one or other or more of those chronic morbidities uh, is particularly important uh, for patients proceeding with care and care planning and delivery. Any questions so far? I assume somebody's monitoring the chat if there are any. There are not yet any questions posted in the chat, but people okay, are welcome to add if they like. Great. So one of the questions in looking at chronic disease measurement is uh, which chronic diseases to use. And um, there is no magic bullet answer. Uh, we have made with Dr. Ware's support a decision to use the 15 item list that is contained within the CMS annual wellness visit. So patients are asked to go through this list and say, have you been told that you have one or more of these diagnoses? And for those that are acknowledged as yes, I have, then the questions are asked about um, how much is that disease impacting on your ability to function at this moment in time? Interestingly, in two of the clinics, including the Colorado practice, they're saying, um, why use some external list, at least on existing patients? Why not focus on the problem list that exists within the electronic health record? So what we are in the process of demonstrating in one of the clinics is, at, is building the measures within the electronic health record. And if a patient is beginning to complete that measure that cues a sweep of the electronic health record problem list and a backup 
medication re related to a particular chronic condition. And if those two tests are passed, then that chronic disease becomes an item in that patient's uh, chronic disease checklist. So it's moving it from a general observation of chronic disease to a patient specific. So, you know, we all got plenty of research that we can do. Why focus on this? And I think uh, there are many who would argue there is some very specific benefit um, that makes the inclusion of patient reports as well as specifically quality of life um, something worthwhile considering. So um, it's been determined that function can be improved based on that data, generate better clinical outcomes. Importantly for um, administrators and policymakers, uh, there's the potential to minimize pre-crisis excuse me, uh, maximize pre-crisis access to care and um, diminish downstream more expensive care, which impacts on lower cost. The health system, the chronic condition and comorbidity focus, um, the utility of single disease trials um, in a pragmatic setting is um, of more and more concern, particularly if we're looking at adult patients with a high probability of multiple um, chronic conditions and comorbidity. Uh, there needs to be rapid risk stratification. Part of the conundrum in the chaos of primary care is we know about the patients who scream loudest. Um, so patients who make it, make it clear that there is a need uh, get attended to. We don't do such a great job at the population end of the spectrum trying to identify those patients in our population who have a particularly strong risk uh, that we need to attend to as rapidly as is viable and reasonable. Uh, this kind of model generates greater efficiency and coordination. And uh, we expect, and it's been demonstrated in multiple trials, um, reduced downstream hospitalization and ER use. So let me talk about uh, a couple of projects and um, get get into some of the weeds on what we tried to do. So we had three project, three practices in the Phoenix area, all of whom um, focused on challenging clinical populations with social determinants, as well as um, complexity and multimorbidity. Um, they were interested in the project at two ends. One, uh, for their own internal purposes, being involved in a, a research project with the university was appealing. Two, they bought into and saw the need uh, for implementing this kind of system as a way to better uh, monitor, manage, and intervene with their patient population. Uh, so, there were really two sets of issues uh, of relevance to this presentation. Uh, the first is we wanted to collect quality of life data uh, from a selected sample of patients. 250 patients in each practice uh, with Medicaid insurance. Uh, and that was a consequence of uh, some political issues in uh, 
Arizona that needed to be responded to. And then the second thing is uh, there is a commercially available, uh, freed up for public use index generated from electronic health record and claims data that is a risk stratification tool that has been validated um, to being able to identify the top 20% of patients with um, high risk for poorer functioning. Um, we added quality of life to that electronic health record constellation uh, because of all the strengths of the quality of life measure. And in addition, frankly, because of all the challenges, there are some practices who no matter what you do in regular care are not going to be able to set up a system to systematically collect and use data from patients. And if we can compare the outputs of the quality of life and the uh, vulnerability data and um, see that the directions are as we would think, then we're in the process of identifying a tool that can be um, more simply and less research intensively added to um, a primary care clinic's ability to do rapid risk stratification and identify those high risk patients. So uh, the pandemic was a terrible time to ask primary care practices to do stuff. It soon became clear that one of the practices um, and FQHC um, was unable to participate. Their IT infrastructure was just too limited. And in fact, we have not generated any data. The other two practices, we're able to generate data sets from both practices on the vulnerability index. Um, and we tried to use claims sent data. As you're aware, using claims data has multiple challenges, including 90, 120, 150 day time lag to be able to get access to the data. So we were thinking if we could get the claim sent data, we would have access to that data more rapidly. And what we discovered is the internal ability to generate the claim sent data in a interpretable way was uh, limited. And the data sets are quite um, different between the two sites. In terms of the quality of life data, um, we are a year into that project. And we are in fact collecting quality of life from one of those two remaining practices. Second practice is on the verge of doing it. We initially tried to use the, quality, the methodology of a email and text blast asking people uh, to respond with their quality of life measurement. And in fact, what happened was uh, as we predicted and we got like 4% response rate and we're continuing that work. In Colorado, there is a much folk, more focused, uh, interested practice in, in doing so. We have been able to, because of the strength of that team, that university community-based team, uh, generate the data set specifically uh, with the fields that are necessary for the analysis and the vulnerability index. And in fact, we have um, we're about three quarters of the way towards collecting the 250 uh, quality of life measures. Uh, the takeaways are uh, extracting from EHRs um, is still a, a limitation. The methodology of uh, collecting patient reported data uh, is challenging and really needs a whole lot more attention than, than at least the practices that I've been able to work with have had the attention units to deliver. So uh, that's the status of this work. Um, I would underscore its importance. Um, if we're really going to be 
pragmatic, there needs to be a patient voice. Uh, the advances in patient reported um, measurement have been very significant over the last number of years. If you can figure out the methodology to get the information in front of the patients, the um, bottom line is that it takes a very short time to generate some very powerful and potent data uh, and the need to continue to focus on practices ability to um, generate and extract uh, data for these kind of purposes is still a challenge and needs to move on. So uh, thank you for the opportunity of, uh, to be able to present this information. And I would hope that uh, there may be a question or two. Uh, yes, there is a question in the chat from Angela Keniston. Angela, if you'd like to come on and ask in person, you're welcome to do so. Hello, Angela. Hi. Uh, so I work in hospital medicine, and there's a lot of conversation about- I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. Can you get closer to the mic? Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, a little better, yep. So um, I work in hospital medicine, and recently there's been a lot more conversation about figuring out patient-reported outcomes for patients who are hospitalized. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering if you have any sort of thoughts on that. Like, do you know if people are using the quality of life instruments um, for patients who are in the hospital? Yeah, so my work has uh, totally focused on outpatient primary care. I would refer you to the John Ware Research Group uh, website. Uh, where there is a bibliography of multiple, multiple studies of uh, general inpatient and specialty inpatient applications of quality of life. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Other questions? There are no other questions in the chat. There are about two minutes left in the session. Well, if nobody has any uh, further comments, uh, thank you very much. I am easily available uh, at my email. And um, if you want to have conversations about this or similar areas, please feel free to get hold of me. Thank you very much, folks. <laughs>